Nuclear Magnetic Resonance Spectroscopy, or NMR, was first discovered in 1946. In the 70s, the introduction of superconducting magnets and Fourier transformation NMR vastly improved the usefulness of the method, and over the years, it has become one of the fundamental techniques chemists use in determining structure. From the analysis of NMR spectra, we can gather information on the functional groups of atoms and where they are located in a molecule in relation to each other. Together with the various other spectroscopic techniques, we can build a full picture of compounds and their molecular structure. In this section, we predominantly study Fourier transformation NMR as it is the most common method used in modern laboratories. Unlike continuous wave NMR, it involves using pulses of radio frequency radiation to excite nuclei to a higher energy level in an applied magnetic field. The advantages are that it's non-destructive and provides a high level of information. However, a large amount of sample is needed than mass spec, and not all nuclei are good for it, as quadrupole moments, broaden NMR signals, and paramagnetic molecules are no good at all uh, because they contain unpaired electrons. Uh, this rules out transition metals um, and any other lanthanide compound. NMR works on the principle that spinning objects create an angular momentum, L, and if they are changed, this will produce a magnetic moment, mu, which is proportional to L. It uses radio frequency photons to induce different nuclear spin state transitions within the interaction of the magnetic moment of an atomic nucleus with an external magnetic field, V0. Nuclei have either an integral spin, i.e. 1, 2 or 3, uh, so on, a fractional spin state, um, i.e. half, 3 over 2, 5 over 2, or any other multiple of a half, or no spin state at all. To have a nuclear spin, atoms must have odd amounts of protons and or neutrons. Uh, for example, um, if a molecule has both an even number of protons and neutrons, it will be spin state zero and therefore will not be active in NMR. Um, fractional spin date states arise from when either the um, number of protons or number of neutrons are, uh, one is odd and one is even, um, making it NMR active. Um, if both the number of protons and neutrons is odd, you get an integral spin state again NMR active. The most straightforward spin state to analyse is L equals a half, so we'll focus on isotopes of this nature, for example hydrogen 1 and carbon 13. Um, nuclei with L equals a half will have spherically symmetrical charge distribution. Uh, quadrupolar nuclei, for example L is greater than a half, interact with any nearby electric field gradient. The strength of these interactions are measured by the quadrupole moment. Uh, large quadrupole moments broaden the peaks of NMR spectra, making them harder to analyse. When the L equals a half nuclei are put in the presence of an external magnetic field, the two spin states exist, plus a half or minus a half. Uh, these spin states are called a magnetic resonance quantum number, um, ML. The lower state energy um, quantum number, ML uh, equals plus a half, is aligned with the field. The higher energy state, uh, ML equals minus a half, is opposed to the field. Uh, the diagram in the learning pack shows the two spin states where Bx is the strength of the applied magnetic field and delta E is the specified energy um, to cause resonance. The energy separation of the two spin states is directly proportional to the strength of the applied magnetic field and the magnetic moment of the nuclei being observed and is given by the formula in the learning pack. In NMR the compound uh, absorbs radiation at the energy frequency delta E that excites its set of nuclei to the plus half from, uh, in the plus half to the uh, minus half spin states um, thus creating a re resonance. The signal strength of the spectra results from the difference between energy absorbed by the spins that uh, make an upwards transition and the em energy emitted by the spins that make a downwards transition. Thus the signal strength is proportional to the population difference between the two states. The amount of nuclei in high or low energy states will differ by an amount determined by the Boltzmann distribution which is given by the formula in the handout. Uh, the stronger the magnet used, the larger the resonance between spin states and the better the quality of spectra. Different magnets give different frequencies, so we use one standardised unit uh, that is the same for all magnets called chemical shift. Uh, chemical shift, which is given by the formula in your handout, uh, sigma equals um, V frequency minus V frequency of reference over the spectrometer frequency times 10 to the 6. Um, all units for chemical shift are in parts per million, it's a standardised unit. Um, electrons are charged spinning particles, so generate a secondary magnetic field that opposes and shields the nucleus from the applied magnetic field. Um, the applied magnetic field must be increased to overcome the shielding effect. Um, this is known as the inductive effect. Different degrees of shielding of atoms result in different chemical shifts. High electron density shielded nuclei 
uh, have to have a higher field to bring them into resonance, and the low electron density shield of the nuclei don't need a, as high a field to bring them into resonance. Uh, the more electronegative um, the group attached to the atom, uh, the less shielding that that atom will experience by electrons, so it's observed at a higher uh, ppm. Bonds, um, obviously, are regions of very high electron density um, and can actually set up magnetic fields of their own. These fields are always stronger in one direction than the other, and the effect of the, this field and the chemical shift of any nearby nuclei uh, is dependent upon the orientation of the nuclei with respect to the bond. Um, pi bonds, for example, are very effective in influencing the chemical shift of nearby protons in hydrogen NMR, um, as shown in the diagram below. Uh, when a double bond is oriented at right angles to the applied field, the electrons are, um, in it are induced to circulate the play of the double bond, uh, which creates a magnetic field opposed to the applied field. Uh, the effect of that is to obviously shift the signals for any hydrogens in the deshielded region downfield. The sample always has to be dissolved in a solvent which does not give itself um, a rise, the rise of any complicated signals within the spectrum. Um, ideally a solvent is chosen so it won't give rise to any signals, unfortunately that's not always possible. Um, if there is a solvent peak within a spectra, um, normally if there's a spectra being provided there will be a label on that peak. Um, the most common solvents used are deuterium. Um, labelled obviously D2O, um, as deuterium, uh, unlike hydrogen, isn't detectable in NMR. Um, CdCl3 is a very common solvent uh, used because most things are soluble in it and it is relatively unreactive. Unre the sample size required for carbon 13 spectra is around about 30 milligrams. Uh, it requires about 256 scans that usually takes about 15 minutes. Hydrogen spectra is much quicker, uh, it only requires 10 milligrams, uh, 16 scans, which is about a minute. The sample should be dissolved in the chosen solvent, placed in a pyrex glass or quartz tube to a depth of about 2 to 3 centimetres. Um, the solution should be free of paramagnetic or insoluble impurities. Um, it, it shouldn't be viscous, a viscous solution will give uh, poor res uh, resolution in the NMR spectra. Um, the tube is lowered between the poles and the magnets uh, into a probe, uh, which has both transmitter and receiver coils built in. Uh, the magnet is automatically tuned and the tube is spun to improve the effective homogeneity of the sample. The instrument is controlled uh, from a keyboard. The data collected is available in a digital form uh, as a table of absorption peaks listed by frequency and intensity or as an FT spectrum, um, like in the example that will be given in the handout.